five. The masks, what somebody called the war of the noses. <laughs> Four. The England team is an anti-racist statement. Three. They're the splash of the policy interventions when they hit the pond. What we haven't accounted for is all of these ripple effects. Two. Oh, it's just a mask. Put it on. It changes the character and the feel of a society. Welcome once again to Planet Normal, the Telegraph podcast with Alison Pearson. Hello. And me, Liam Halligan. So the 19th of July is set to be Freedom Day, in England at least. But Boris Johnson isn't encouraging street parties or celebrations to mark the end of anti-Covid restrictions. Speaking from Downing Street, the Prime Minister seemed downbeat and apologetic, rather than jubilant that the UK's world-class vaccine programme is clearly working. The number of tests each day has gone up. We're conducting well over twice as many tests as we were in January. Back then, 13% of those COVID tests were positive, and during the first wave in the spring of 2020, it was no less than 30%. Today, only around 2 or 3% of COVID tests are positive. And of course, most cases are now among younger, less vulnerable people, with the older population largely double jabbed. Yet still, the government wants us to limit the numbers meeting indoors or outdoors, restricting visits to friends and family. We may have to check in to high-risk events and keep wearing masks, which won't be mandatory in England, but social pressure from some to keep wearing them will surely be intense. That pesky NHS app will keep pinging, with evidence growing that more and more of us are simply deleting it from our phones. And who can say that yet another school year won't be disrupted from this September, the third in a row? Alison, how do you feel about July the 19th? Time to party? Or has freedom yet to flourish? (laughs) I've just had a house move, Halligan. Anything's going to look good compared to moving house, which I've I've decided that moving house should be added to the grounds for justifiable homicide. (laughs) extenuating circumstances you're on. Absolutely. It's kind of like, where's the, where's the microphone on which I will be recording my podcast? Oh, He packed my contact lenses. What else was I meant to do? <laughs> he, packed, he packed my contact lenses. Exactly. Anyway, let's not, let's not go there. A private grief. <laughs> now, what I, I just got to say, we're going to start by saying, don't you get demob happy, as Boris said. Don't have a jubilee, Halligan, because, you know, we... We, you know, we know where that will end with, our, you know, drinking and public displays of affection, exactly as we saw at Wembley Stadium, funnily enough, with 60,000 people. But that's different. That's a pilot event. Yes. So Monday, finally, finally, all remaining legal limits on social contact will end in England. But masks, as you said, in crowded areas will be, quotes expected and recommended. So that's a very, very odd grey area, isn't it? And I think Boris was definitely rowing back on his clarion call of personal responsibility, because I think our old mates on Sage, Liam, I think they've got to him again with their um, shroud waving. And we, we saw this week the government's chief scientific modeller, Professor Graham Medley, hospital cases will soar in the rush to lift COVID rules. Well, they keep saying that it's a rush and they shouldn't be all released at once. But if you cast your minds back, the first non-essential retail was opened back in April. So I don't think it's really a rush. But uh, Professor Medley suggested that the exit wave could put 2,000 people in hospital every day for six weeks, placing a considerable burden on the NHS. So Here we are again, really. Yes, it's going to be, uh, it is going to be Freedom Day. And I think we we can both feel we've we've staggered through these months with the help of Planet Normal listeners, haven't we? And I think there will be cause for relief and celebration. But then there is this, as you said, what um, the masks, what somebody called the war of the noses. We've got Sadiq (laughs) Khan. So what, what's happened with the mask? Have you noticed this, Halligan? It's, it's absolutely typical lefty virtue signalling, isn't it? So masks are to remain compulsory on London transport, even though Sir Patrick Valance, our chief scientific officer, admitted in an offhand moment that 
masks were really only of marginal benefit. Now, when I wear my mask, if I've got my glasses on, they steam up. And the reason they steam up, Liam, is because all the aerosols coming out of my mouth are coming out of the top of the mask and going into the glasses. So they're not really preventing it. Nevertheless, I think you're right. I think this is going to create a sort of two-tier society. Sadiq Khan said that wearing a mask is the most unselfish thing you can do. Now, I really take exception to that because I think the most unselfish thing we can do now, in fact, I think it's our patriotic duty to live as normally and boldly and colourfully and joyfully as we can. But I do think we're going to see the Labour strongholds, the cities, they're going to be masked up pretending they're morally superior to the rest of us. And outside the M25 and in other more normal areas, shall we say, mask wearing will drop off entirely. What do you reckon, Halligan? I think the British political establishment as a whole has managed to come up yet again with an absolute mess, a hodgepodge of guidance, laws, stipulations, not only within England itself, where the vast majority of Brits live, but across the, the four nations. I mean, I've been really struck covering this the last couple of days on GB News. We heard from Nicola Sturgeon earlier in the week. We just heard from Mark Drakeford. We obviously heard from Boris Johnson at Downing Street as we spoke about uh, in the opening of this episode of Planet Normal. And in England, mask wearing isn't compulsory. In Scotland, it is. And in Wales, it is unless you're in the pub. <laughs> I mean, how can that reflect any honest reading of the science? And the science itself of mask wearing is confused. They have become a kind of cultural totem, haven't they? And I do fear that on the overland train I get every morning to London from the east of England and on the tube, I think now that in England mask wearing is to be made non-mandatory, but opinion polls show um, whatever you think of them, that about three quarters of people think that we should carry on wearing masks. I do think there's going to be proper aggro on the trains. I do think the finger wagging classes are going to be getting in the face of the more free thinking classes. And I do think there will be conflict. I, I wish there was a stipulation one way or the other. And I would say that on balance, it makes sense not to wear masks given the very, very flaky science around mask wearing. Having said that, and maybe you and I have discussed this a, a lot, having said that, I will carry a mask. And even though I'm in England most of my life, I will wear a mask in situations where it is overcrowded and even where I get the sense that other people want me to wear a mask. You may feel, Alison, that crosses a kind of line of, of principle but you know I'm physically a big presence in any situation I'm, I'm not <laughs> elfine like you co-pilot I'm a big hairy loud belching bloke you are and I'm very conscious of that and so even though I, I sometimes wear glasses as well particularly when I'm on the train reading doing my emails getting ready for my journalistic Day and managing my, my family and my personal life, as so many of us do these days, partly from our gizmos. But I will wear a mask in those situations, even though I'd much rather not be wearing a mask. Not as purist as you think, Liam, because, you know, since June the 21st, which was supposed to be our Freedom Day, that would actually have been the best time to open up because the stats will just, you know, the numbers will not get any better than that. So I have mainly stopped wearing my mask. But like you, I hope I've been being considerate. So I've been into a pharmacy. I've been to see a doctor. And I've been in a cab with a, an older gentleman who was, you know, quite overweight and unhealthy. I thought this would be respectful to him. I'm absolutely being respectful, I think, and just, just uh, acknowledging that many people don't feel as confident as we do. I think what annoys me, and I think this is, you know, we'll, we'll talk a bit about later about taking the knee. I just think there are certain things that the left weaponizes to make themselves look virtuous. And, oh, if you don't, you know, if you don't agree with us, you're evil. Actually, there are downsides to these restrictions, Liam. We, we've got some amazing emails coming later in the podcast from people pointing out the terrible adverse consequences of being pinged with the test and trace. And as you said earlier, 
more than a third of people aged 18 to 34 have deleted the NHS COVID app. Good for them and hardly surprising. I just found just before we started recording that Izzy, uh, our lovely producer, is now having to quarantine for 10 days, even though she's had a negative test because someone she came into contact with at work was pinged yesterday. Today, Liam, there are around 860,000 children in England and Wales who aren't in school, that most of them, almost all of them will be perfectly healthy. So what we've got is these, you know, these restrictions have got to go because the chaos, the chaos they're causing, not just the test and trace, coming back to the masks, to me, we want a normal society where you can see people's faces, where children don't attend weddings or funerals and cannot see the faces of their parents or their friends. This is not nothing. You know, this is this is not a sort of, oh, it's just a mask, put it on. It, it changes the character and the feel of a society. And I really feel that getting back to normal is presented as the reckless thing. I think on the contrary, I think being too cautious is rapidly becoming the reckless thing. And what do we make, Liam, of this COVID vaccine passports, which we were told, weren't we, were off the table? But now there's a, a, a much more sort of, you know, there's a kind of underlying threat, COVID certification checks, that's obviously vaccine passports, will be advised for large events, potentially including theatres, concerts, sports and nightclubs. And there's a sort of tacit threat from the government that it reserves the right to mandate certification at a later date. We've already had two big nightclub chains in the UK, Recon UK and Tokyo, Tokyo Industries, who basically said that they are not going to be checking COVID-19 status because they want their patrons to have a really nice time. What do you think about the passports, Lynn? I think there are a couple of measures that are being introduced, Alison, and they're not getting nearly enough media attention because the media is focused on this sort of war of the noses, as you call it, Mm. about masks and ongoing claims that Britain is systemically racist, claims that I absolutely don't share and vehemently reject while not denying for one minute there is some racism in, in Britain. Of course there is. There will always be morons And it's partly the vaccine passports that you talk about. I think the hospitality and and the night economy sector are being set up by the government. So when cases rise, as they will, and let's hope that as cases rise, hospitalizations and deaths remain very, very low, as they have been. When cases rise, the government can threaten to close down those clubs and hospitality venues that haven't been going through this vibe-killing process of, of checks and balances and all the rest of it. And also, I mean, I'm amazed at how little commentary there's been, Alison, on the vote in the House of Commons, I think it was on Tuesday night, for compulsory vaccinations in care homes. Now, this is something that you and I have discussed closely, and we've disappointed some Planet Normal listeners, certainly I did, When I said, and I stick to this, I do think if you work in a care home, then you should have to be vaccinated. And there will be some people who refuse and they should be helped to get alternative employment and even compensated to get alternative employment, as I've constantly stressed. Even though I've stressed that, people will still email and we always love to get your emails, but people will still email and accuse me unfairly. I would say, of throwing care home workers under a bus. I'm not doing that by any means. All I'm saying is that if you have your most vulnerable people in care homes and we've basically you know, busted a gut nationally, internationally to vaccinate people, it seems a bit strange if people can work with the very, very vulnerable without being vaccinated when their own flesh and blood can't actually see them unless they're vaccinated. So... I think that is a huge debate that's not being had, the compulsory vaccinations in care homes. There's a lot of things that aren't being said, aren't there? You know, let's be brave on planet normal. So the situation in care homes is an enormous number of care home workers. They're lower paid and they're often from ethnic minorities. 
Now, as I understand, Liam, about 31% of black Britons haven't been vaccinated and 15% of, of Asian Britons haven't been vaccinated. So there is going to be quite an overlap, isn't there, between the people who are refusing the vaccination and the people that they're going to tell have to have this compulsory vaccination. My concern, I mean, my concern is twofold, really. Are we going to have this apartheid system where, you know, black Britons or Asian Britons, you know, you can't go into concerts or theatres because you're vaccine hesitant. You might be vaccine hesitant with some cause. And I see that the purpose of vaccine passports, I think, is to force it's a kind of compulsion. Because if they're saying, oh, you won't be able to go to pubs or restaurants, they're going to try and force teens and 20s particularly to get jabbed because the vaccine rollout has stalled a bit with the younger generation. But we know, Liam, we've had guests on the show who've explained that this age group, their risk for the virus is vanishingly low and the vaccine might have only a tiny risk. But nevertheless, it's probably a greater risk than provided by the virus. So that makes me uneasy. And I do think that COVID vaccine passports could change the nature of our society. I mean, Sherelle Jacobs, who's one of the Telegraph's best commentators, made the point that this would be the first time we would be trading personal data for access to goods, not paying money, giving our personal data. Now, I do find that quite chilling. Now, just quickly over the channel, we're seeing my ex-boyfriend, very Your much chef. ex, my sherry, not my sherry amour anymore, mister. So Macron has announced this pass sanitaire élargie, and from the beginning of August in France, a vaccine passport will be needed for coffee shops, restaurants, supermarkets. You won't even be able to buy Blimey. food, trains, hospitals, bars and buses. Now, this is unbelievable. And and let's not forget, Liam, we've got a French election coming up. France, the French, as we've discussed before, haven't we, have been remarkably vaccine hesitant. They don't trust their state at all. So Macron, it strikes me, is taking this huge gamble with this absolutely draconian measures. And I'm I'm absolutely, I'm convinced they'll probably be, you know what they're like, We we all sit at home Grumbling, listening to Planet Normal. Setting cars alight and overturning (laughs) all kinds of things. Particularly in the banlieue where we know we're going to have, unlike us, let's come on to this other big topic of the week. I mean, France, unlike us, has a huge, huge problem with racism. And I couldn't help thinking... We'll tell the listeners that we watched the England game together, didn't we? In, um, yeah, we did. In, uh, with Carson, our families or some of our, our families. Families and, and dogs. And, Not that we've you know, all got lots of families, but some of our kids were there and some weren't. <laughs> some of our kids and you've done lovely barbecue and sausages and everything. So when we had the, you know, this obviously very controversial, you could talk you could talk a bit about the match. I was learning a lot from you because I went, went away and wrote a piece and I thought I'll just quote, quote Halligan because he knows what he's talking about. But when the, pe- the obviously the penalty shootout went very, very badly and it was very notable when our guys, you know, young, very, there's a big controversy isn't there about whether these quite inexperienced players should have been literally put on the spot with what I described in my column as cold feet, because why did they have cold feet? Because they'd been on the bench and they'd only been allowed on the pitch 20 seconds earlier to take two of the most important sh- shots in, in, in the game's history. You know, that's how, that's how bad it was. But when Saka missed, that wonderful young 19-year-old boy missed, you know, Harry Kane was there, arms round him, Southgate came out, was hugging them. When Mbappe, the brilliant young French player, missed his uh, penalty for France, the, the French players totally shunned it and walked away. And I feel, coming on to this huge controversy of the week, really, which you'll have seen with the Prime Minister's questions, I didn't actually see it, but um, Keir Starmer really going for Boris over this. You know what I think, Liam? I think there is no need for England to make an anti-racist statement. The England team is an anti-racist statement. So when I hear this stuff about systemic racism, you must take the knee if you don't agree with this, you know, you're again from the left, you know, you're a bad person. Absolutely not. I feel immense pride that our team in the Euros was the most naturally diverse and comradely of any. I think that's right. I really bridle at this stuff as well, because often I find the people who 
could suggest that certainly people in the broadcast media who suggest that Britain is systemically racist didn't have the, the massively ethnically diverse upbringing that I had in London, borough of Brent in northwest London in the 70s, the most ethnically diverse borough at the time in the country. And, you know, my family's experienced racism over the years since coming here in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s. There is still racism in the UK. There will always be a small proportion of morons. But by God, what pro massive progress we have made. And I would like to see not us not commenting when there's bad stuff on social media, but we should always put it in context, in the context of how much improvement there's been. What a tiny percentage of England fans, these people aren't England fans, what a tiny percentage of the British population these people represent. The fact that uh, it's now becoming clear a lot of these really nasty, odious tweets, which I completely reject and abhor, actually originated overseas. If the tech giants weren't so capable as they are of controlling our politicians, if our political elite wasn't so in hock to the Silicon Valley denizens, hoping they might get a nice job when they leave politics, not that they know one end of a computer from another, then maybe we could get these guys' heads in a vice and say, look, you have to tell us who these anonymous accounts are. This is a hate crime. This is a prosecutable offence to direct such awful invective publicly to a particular individual, albeit a world-class footballer who's 19 and put one single foot wrong after a month of playing brilliantly for his country. And I feel enormously strongly about this and I get emotional about this because I can see the progress that my family's relationship has made with England over a generation or two. Yes. And it's been absolutely huge. And I will not have people with almost no experience of genuine multicultural Britain, growing up in multicultural Britain, telling me that I don't understand England because I am not willing immediately and always to say, oh, yeah, of course we're a systemically racist country. We are absolutely not a systemically racist country. And I thought you put it really well, Alison. The England team is an anti-racist statement by its very character, by its very makeup, by the very fact that Gareth Southgate put on the field, put into bat, if you like, to mix my metaphors, at the most important moment, three wonderfully gifted black players who on this occasion, unfortunately, you know, couldn't do what they desperately wanted to do, given the opportunity for a handful, and it is a handful of morons, to say awful things. It was interesting that some analysis I read showed that out of 585,000 tweets sent to England players during the group stage, 44 were racist. Now, you could say that's 44 too many, but I think it's been very much fixated on and talked up. And Southgate said something, he said some really good things, but he said, we're a country that tends to dwell too much on our negatives. And I, and I do think that's right. And I think that there was a lot to be proud of and this business with Tyrone Mings, one of the players, criticising Priti Patel, the Home Secretary, for stoking the fire of racism because she described taking the knee back at the start of the championships as gesture politics. Now, I don't think that was right for him to accuse her of that. I think she herself, Priti Patel, from an Indian background, has been the subject of extraordinary racism and sexism. I think she reflects the feelings of a lot of conservatives who are anti-racist, but who, who see in the Black Lives Matter quite a destructive group. You'll remember, Liam, a year ago in the summer, there, there were those demonstrations where, you know, police horses had bicycles thrown at them. One uh, woman officer spent two months in hospital. There was defacing of public statues. I don't think that gesture of taking the knee is separated out in many people's minds from that very anti-establishment, anti-British gesture. So again, I think it's Keir Starmer today showboating to Boris, oh, you know, if you don't support this, you know, you're a bad person. No, we can disagree with you. We can agree that where racism is bad, but we can also agree that we don't particularly like that gesture, which to me, Liam, in my mind, 
it elides the American and British experience. And we've said this before on Planet Normal. America has this bruising, horrific history of slavery. We don't have that. We have made enormous strides in this country. I personally think the BLM movement has done more to antagonize racism, racist feeling in this country than otherwise. Before we go to our guest, Liam, I think it's just worth having a little bit of George. George is a, a, an anonymous source who his or her identity is known to us, but we don't disclose it. We can't independently verify the statistics that George reports to us from NHS England, because by definition, they haven't yet been published and they may never be published, but we are absolutely confident of their authenticity and veracity. He has kept us so brilliantly informed through this period. And I thought it was really interesting to ask George this week about all the alarmist statistics that are being bandied about to spoil the great reopening Day of Freedom on Monday. So you know that we like Halligan, we we like putting to George something that one of the scientists has said in the week. In your mischievous way. <laughs> <laughs> Luckily, I haven't got anything to throw at the radio because everything's packed up in boxes in, in the house. But <laughs> Professor Peter Openshaw told the Today programme on Monday morning that masks should basically go on being mandatory. He's actually comparing wearing a mask to wearing a seatbelt. But Professor Openshaw did say... That the reason for this is that hospital admissions for COVID are up nearly 60% in a week. That sounds bad, doesn't it, Halligan? Yeah, yeah. And I I'm asked scared. George. I'm scared. We're all trembling. We're all trembling. George replied, we need to lay this tired statistic to rest now. It's just meaningless. As of Friday, the number of patients with COVID in hospital was still only creeping up. No one at NHS England is talking about hospitals coming under pressure from COVID. A few weeks ago, they were far more worried. So I've got no idea why the BBC feels the need to keep bringing it up. I'm not sure which figures Professor Openshaw was basing his stats on. But if we compare the latest figures, that was Sunday, the 11th of July, with the same figure reported a week earlier, the changes are as follows. Admissions were up 50%, Liam, that's from 121 COVID patients admitted daily to 181 patients admitted. But in patients diagnosed with COVID after admission, we're up 36% from 173 to 236. And the discharges of COVID patients, which the scientists always forget to mention, discharges from hospital are up. 69% 69% from 163 to 276 patients daily. Those are people who are getting better co-pilot. Let's not forget, most people recover from COVID. Now, this is just to punch this home, all right? The net result is the number of beds occupied by COVID is up 44%. But the point is, Liam, is that, that these people, are, there are only tiny numbers of people really out of the overall number of beds. And one of the main things which Mark Harper of the COVID recovery group raised with Sajid Javid in the, in, the, in the Commons this week is the majority of so-called COVID admissions, that's what we hear on the news, the majority, 50%, are now being diagnosed two days after admission. They are not people who have been admitted to hospital with COVID. Over half of all so-called COVID hospital patients were admitted because of another disease or an accident. And Sajid Javid, who's made a good start as health secretary, replied that the patient data doesn't make the distinction between those admitted with the virus and those admitted with other things. And he has sought urgent clarification. So that is hugely important. Hi, listeners. I'm Claire Cohen, The Telegraph's women's editor, and the host of another podcast that might be just up your street. Even saying that gives me imposter syndrome. But that's what the show's all about. If you've ever had that niggling feeling that you don't belong in the room, that you feel a bit like a fraud and could be found out at any moment, this one's for you. Over six episodes on my podcast, Imposters, I meet a woman at the top of her game and find out how she defeated self-doubt to get there. I've been conditioned 
to think that I should be at the bottom of the hierarchy ladder and therefore it's a miracle that I'm even where I am. Let's let's give myself credit for that. I'm not someone who walks into a room with entitlement. I never have. You can either choose to live in fear or you can think how can I make the best of today and that's a conscious choice. You can find it by clicking on the link in the episode description or search imposters wherever you're listening to this. Now, this is the 60th episode of Planet Normal. Can you believe it? Hooray! 60 up. <laughs> and in our previous episodes, we've had some really interesting and distinguished and diverse guests. But some of our most interesting guests have been academics. Academics like Shinetra Gupta, the Oxford epidemiologist, who, of course, was one of the signatories, one of the creators of the Great Barrington Declaration, calling for a more age-discriminated approach to lockdown and to shielding. Now, one of Shinetra Gupta's co-authors over the years has been Professor Paul Dolan. He's at the LSE. He's a behavioural scientist. And Paul recently wrote a blog with Shinetra, and we'll put the link in the show notes to this episode, in which he criticised the government's what he called attempt now to follow a zero COVID policy. He called such a policy unrealistic. And so when I invited Professor Paul Dolan onto Planet Normal, I started by asking him, what are the dangers of that zero COVID policy? Well, first of all, the dangers of zero generally, I'm trained as an economist and we, we talk a lot about the margin. So the marginal benefits of an, of an additional change in whichever direction and the marginal costs. As you approach zero of anything, the costs of achieving that additional unit as you get closer to zero become greater and greater and greater to the point at which it's unlikely that zero of anything would be an efficient or indeed a fair outcome. So in the case of COVID, to completely have suppressed the virus would have meant engaging in quite significant policies of suppression and, you know, like closing borders in, as I say, January 2020, um, to keep the virus out until a vaccine was in place. That hasn't been possible for, for a whole host of reasons. And so it's a case of living with it. And it is interesting, isn't it? Though so that the vaccine was the bugle or the toot of freedom you know, that was you know coming over the hill. That was where the vaccine was going to get us. So I do think there's a really interesting discussion to be had about the social contract. You know, people have complied to some large degree with with really significant restrictions on their on their freedom, on their fun, on on their life experiences impacted upon children in all sorts of ways. And that was with the promise that the vaccine was going to liberate us. And so I think it's really important that that social contract is honoured. And not just a social contract between individuals and the state, but I think between different groups in society too. Those that have borne the most significant costs of the measures will, will quite rightly, I think, and justifiably question whether well, not it was worth it, but what it was for. If we were doing this pursuant of a policy where we could live with the virus subject to people being vaccinated, then as many people have said now, if not now, then when? And that, again, is why July the 19th is such a significant day. Paul, you've said uh, in your blog with Shinetra Gupta, who, of course, <laughs> doesn't need to defer to the epidemiologist because she is one, you've said that the journey towards an endemic equilibrium will inevitably involve an increase in rates of infection. We can expect an increase in the rates of infection, mm. can't we? Inevitably, an increase in the number of cases as restrictions come off and indeed as the number of tests keep going up. How do you think that's going to play out, both in terms of government policy and broader politics in the months after July the 19th? Well, I, I mean, the short answer is I don't know. And I think anybody who who claims with any degree of certainty about anything is probably someone that you can't trust. I mean, the reason I say I defer to the epidemiologist on the virus transmission, but only on that, right? Not on not on the wider economic, social, and health impacts of the virus and the measures put in place to suppress it, because it's been extraordinary to me as a social scientist that there hasn't been very many social science voices out there and been very many people in academia generally that have been, shall we just say, questioning, if even not critical, of 
some of what we've done. I find that surprising, especially given the inherent uncertainty that we've been facing. You'd expect people to disagree. And the fact that there hasn't been more prominence generally given to to the economic and social impacts of what we've done. And we have deferred too much (laughs) to a very narrow set of policy objectives, which are about transmission rates, hospitalizations and deaths, which of course are important, but they're the splash of the policy interventions when they hit the pond. What we haven't properly accounted for is all of these ripple effects, which are really significant. I mean, I'm taken with your imagery there, Paul, that the splash of policy intervention, but then the ripple effects, I agree with you, the ripple effects haven't been nearly enough uh, highlighted. You know, really serious, prominent economists are coming forward to the extent that they should about the impact of lockdown, the impact of uh, economic downturn on death. The Nobel laureate Angus Deaton's talked a lot about the deaths of despair from uh, economic downturns. And I'm amazed that hasn't played a bigger role in public policy. I, I agree with you. And my view would be that as Freedom Day comes and goes and the number of cases goes up, there's going to be a tremendous pressure on the government to reverse. There's going to be pressure from from Nicola Sturgeon, from Mark Drakeford, from the Labour Party, from all the enemies of the government, if you like, to try and demonstrate that they're being irresponsible. And then it, I think scientists of good standing will have to come to the fore and say, look, lots and lots and lots of cases but when you've still got low hospitalizations and low deaths, that's what we need. <laughs> that's called immunity. Yeah, it is. So there's a couple of things there. I think the situational blindness, as psychologists call it, was, I guess, perhaps not surprising early on, right? So it's where you pay attention to something that's important because it's in front of you. And so, for example, in the airline industry, uh, planes would be crashing out of the sky because the pilot would be looking at the instrumentation, but not checking whether mostly he, sometimes she, had a co-pilot sitting next to them, right? So having a co-pilot is really important, um, but they were situationally blind to what really mattered. And the similar thing applies in the policy response to COVID. There's been such a fixation on the splash, on those figures relating only to COVID, that there hasn't been any attention paid to everything else that's going on outside of it. Now, the way that we overcome situational blindness in the airline industry and in other and in other areas too, is to have very simple checklists. We haven't in the very least, got in front of decision makers a set of major consequences that follow from the policies that they put in place. The impact on economic activity, which, as you quite rightly say, also leads to people having worse life experiences and life expectancies. The impact of, you know, social social impacts, mental health, loneliness, which, by the way, if you're ranking all of the interventions that you would want to put in place to improve people's life expectancies, reducing loneliness would be right up there. It's it's above diet and exercise as having you know a major cause and effect on, on when people die. So even if you only cared about this, <laughs> you wouldn't you wouldn't be situationally blind in the way that we have been. So so what is it that explains the fact that 16 months on, we're still in a world where we don't even have checklists, let alone as I would like you know, some proper well-being related metric that would in, that would enable us to properly account for all of these impacts. We're not even anywhere near that. So why is that? Well, there's a powerful narrative to preserve life that has been dominant throughout our response. You know, we all know, you know, Liam, that you don't listen really very much to, to evidence and facts, that you pay attention to stories and narratives. We all like a good story. So when a story becomes compelling, obviously drives a lot of what we do as individuals and as policymakers. And the narrative to preserve life is a very powerful one. It's uh, I mean, what is the what is the counter narrative to that? Like let people die or um, appropriately balance costs and benefits. They're very weak arguments. We all want to signal that we're good and decent people. It's a very important way in which we can do that is to say how much preserving life matters. But of course, actually, you're not taking account of lives elsewhere, but you're focusing narrowly on the splash. And that preserve life narrative is actually present even in times of calm, as well as in times of crisis, right? So about a quarter of our healthcare spending goes on the last, I don't remember the exact time frame, but you know, last few weeks of someone's life. Now, of course, some of that is going to be effective use. I would suspect that much of it isn't. So we have this narrative, you know, to extend and preserve life at all costs, much of the time anyway, And that's now morphed into a narrative to prevent illness, which is why it's a really long answer to what you asked me at the beginning, which I don't know what's going to happen. Because because if you'd said to me 16 months ago, there would be calls for restrictions on 
basic liberties and freedoms. If you said to me 16 months ago that there would be restrictions suggested in order to limit the number of largely young people going into hospital for a short period of time, I would say that that's not possible. That's not the kind of society that any of us would want to live in. But because we've we've dropped the frog in the water and we've boiled, you know, as you turn the temperature up, you can boil the frog by heating it up ever so slowly rather than by chucking it into the water, it will jump straight out again. Because we boiled that frog ever so slowly, I don't know how much more boiling we're willing to take. We've, we've been willing to take a lot more than I would have expected. So I don't know that I'm optimistic about what's going to happen in the winter when the NHS will face, as it does every single year, pressures on you know the capacity within ICUs, which has always been part. If you look at the news headlines every single winter, that's exactly the same headline that we have every single year. But, but now our interpretation of it is somewhat different, that we actually are now willing to impose restrictions on people to try to deal with capacity constraints that might exist within the NHS. So short answer is, I don't know. And, and you say in your blog with Shinetra, you say that Freedom Day, the 19th of July, should be the day we stop presenting data on the number of daily infections, the number of cases. You say this number has no real meaning once the link between infection and disease has been broken, and we are now reaching endemic equilibrium, it will only serve to further scare a population who have been made to feel afraid, and disproportionately so, for far too long. Do you think, like Laura Dodsworth, a previous guest on Planet Normal, who wrote State of Fear, do you think there's been a deliberate policy here of frightening the population? The answer to that is not, I don't think it's straightforwardly yes, but it's about as close to straightforwardly yes <laughs> as I would give for any answer. I mean, there's the famous quotes from the Spy B minutes, you know, the behavioural scientists that advise on SAGE, saying that essentially people need to be made more afraid of the virus than their risks would suggest. Now, that, that appears to be a deliberate attempt to scare people. And, you know, we know that fear can be motivating for action. That's right. Uh, it's a very evolutionarily advantageous response to, you know, to certain situations that we ought to be quite rightly afraid of. So using emotional states to engage people to change their behavior has been used widely in many ways by marketing and advertising, right? They use it all the time. We're, we're, we're being influenced by the manipulation of our emotional states to buy to buy more stuff. Is it different when policymakers do it? And has it been done to a degree that we haven't seen before? And I think a lot of the answer to that question will depend on, well, will, will turn on entirely, whether, whether you consider the consequences that have been achieved as a result of it to be worth it. But I do think the fact that when you have manipulated, I think that's, that is the right word, people to feel afraid beyond the risk that they personally face, I think that is that can only be be seen as seen as harmful. You know, it would have been a legitimate message to say to young people, and not in the "don't kill granny" kind of way, which I think that's that's been a I don't think that's been a particularly helpful form of messaging either. But to say that it's not your own risk that are the problem; it's the impact that your behaviour will have on others. That's an entirely legitimate message. But when you've soaked fear so much in the way that we have for sixteen months, fear is not like a tap; you can't just turn it on and then off again. Once it's turned on, it is very, very hard to turn turn off again. We've kind of, you know, manipulated it. That is true. But there has to be something there in the first place. And I do think this this existential dread that most of us face to some large degree at some point in our lives, the fear of dying, has been incredibly prominent and has been been activated not only by policymakers over the last 16 months, but by the virus itself, right? I do think that we've had this sense where we thought we might be I don't know, living forever, you know, living to 150, we're going to have full body blood transfusions and never die, you know. And a virus like this or any virus is a reminder of our mortality. Yeah. It makes mortality salient. And that frightens us. And uh, it's, it's why I've actually been, I think it's really interesting that most of the policy responses have been around the world driven by either the advisors or the policymakers themselves have been around my age, Liam. They've been around 50 years plus, plus or minus a few years, which is where, where people are most scared of dying. If you if you ask young people, they're not scared of dying because they're going to live for live forever and never thought about it. But what's really interesting, if you ask older people, and it's why I think we should have had much more diversity of opinion, perspective, and age group in what we did, because it'd be very interesting to find out. No one's really bothered to ask. Find out from older people whether and to what extent they would have been willing to 
engage in these measures for their own benefit, let alone for the for 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 that of other people. And I know from some of the early work I did as a health economist that many of those older people would say, I don't want to be socially isolated. I don't want to be lonely. I'd rather have the contact with my family and, you know, live out the remaining time that I have in good quality of life. Paul, final question. What's it been like during this pandemic being an academic who's actually prepared to question the conventional wisdom, who's prepared to question lockdown? How have your colleagues treated you? That's a really good question, Liam. I went into academia because I like a good argument and I like a good discussion. So I have very strong views about many things. And I have a strong view that I'm willing to listen to other people's strong views and to evidence that might lead me to change my mind. And as I said before, this has been such an unprecedented, the word's been used so many times, uncertain world that it scared me, frankly, that so many academics are so confident about what the right response should be. I don't know anybody could have that degree of confidence in knowing what the right answer is. I come to this uh, point about the the types of people making the decisions. If you think about academics, many of the senior academics will be, you know, around around my age. They work in the public sector, so they're probably a little bit more cautious to begin with. They are in academia, so that probably makes them even more cautious. They they've got nice pensions, nice houses. Lockdowns actually haven't really harmed them very much. So they get many of the benefits that come because they have their fear of dying reduced uh, without having to bear any of the costs. Was, wasn't there a paper out yesterday that the, the, that the average increase in uh, assets or wealth or whatever has been about £8,000 over the last year for, for, for many workers? We've had a, a massive redistribution, haven't we, um, towards people who are able to work from home on Zoom away from those that aren't. So I, it has it has troubled me, Liam, that there haven't been more people from the social science community in particular coming out and saying, hold on a second, has the response been proportionate um, and willing to discuss and debate that? And I have had, you know, conversations with academics who have, who have told me that I shouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And I'm saying, well, let's I'm, I'm quite happy to debate this with you because I don't know that I, know, I have all the all the answers, but I'm pretty certain that you can't be certain that you have. Professor Paul Dolan, thanks a lot for staying away with us on Planet Normal. Thank you so much, mate. So that was Professor Paul Dolan, Alison. He's a professor at the London School of Economics. He's got his own podcast entitled Duck Rabbit that you can find on Apple Podcasts and all the usual places. He's a genuinely questioning voice from the groves of academia. What did you think? I thought he was fantastic. I mean, I thought... You know that wonderful feeling when you have like a long, cool glass of water of someone so crystal clear, uh, so refreshing and really illuminating things that you and I have been, you know, discussing these many months. Of course, I particularly love the fact that he said having a co-pilot is really important. (laughs) You're very important to me and I hope we don't suffer from what Paul Dolan described as situational blindness because... As he said, there have been major consequences and there go on being major consequences, don't they, from the situational blindness. I was very interested in this idea of the social contract. Um, You know, I'm about to go off on holiday to a red list country quite controversially. But Paul Dolan said that the social contract is that people have complied to a remarkable degree, you know, given up our liberties on the promise that the vaccine was going to mean freedom. And one of the reasons, Liam, I'm about to go away on holiday is A, because I was there in Turkey last year when I was unvaccinated and no one was vaccinated. I thought, you know, he said so many interesting things that we could talk about, but I think it has been the force of going from the, the powerful narrative to preserve life, as Paul Dolan said, to becoming the narrative to prevent illness altogether. And the point he made that really resonated with me was, we would never have believed, would we, that there would be calls for ongoing restrictions on our liberties to prevent a few young people going into hospital for a short period. I mean, the mission creep has been quite something, hasn't it? It has indeed. And I I think I know the LSE well. I used to be on the faculty at the LSE as a, as a junior researcher, it's a pretty foreboding place. You know, a lot of big, powerful intellects knocking around. 
And Paul Dolan will have come under a lot of pressure to not say what he's been saying, to not be questioning lockdown the way he has been from very much a scientific and a factual basis, albeit from the social sciences rather than the natural sciences. I thought the most interesting part of the discussion with Paul Dolan, Alison, was when we were talking about the situation going forward after July the 19th into the autumn and winter, because the number of cases will go up as those anti-COVID restrictions are eased and the media will focus on that and opposition politicians will focus on those number of cases. They won't give a hoot about the percentage of COVID tests that are positive, as I've tried to highlight, and they will largely undermine evidence, the very solid evidence now that the link between cases on the one hand in the context of much, much more testing and hospitalizations and deaths on the other is now very, very severely dented, uh, even broken if you eyeball the graphs and look at the data. So I do think I'm afraid, and I say this with some trepidation and regret, I do think that come this autumn, there is a danger that another school year will be disrupted. When I say that, even though, you know, I have school-aged children and it makes me literally physically ache and want to cry when I say that. But I just think our politics is not capable of having a rational discussion based on the data. There are too many people out there who, frankly, in my view, are toe rags because all they want to do is stress the negatives and fail to appreciate that any aspect of life and leadership involves some kind of risk. And so I do fear that there will be further lockdowns going forward. And I say that even though I'm generally, as I hope I've conveyed in these last 60 episodes, a pretty optimistic person. I mean, surely what one of the things, key things that Paul Dolan was telling us is in this decision making, and you and I have gone on about it, haven't we? The men, this small circle of undoubtedly highly intelligent men, but of a very particular narrow bent. Um, you remember Professor John Lee, um, the pathologist, said, I'm a nerd. He said, I wouldn't want people like me to run the world. The nerds have been running our world, Liam. And as Paul Dolan said to us, there's been no diversity of age groups in the decision making. There's been no diversity, very little diversity of gender. So we've had a particularly narrow cohort who have been putting safety first. And the reason that they've managed to impose that safety first is because they've made you feel like a bad person if you challenge what they're doing, because then they can say, you want people to die. Quite clearly, none of us wants people to die, but we do want our children and the people we love to live. So I said in my column this week that I think it's our patriotic duty now to live boldly and to live well. Um, I really do feel that because I, I dread to think if they think that they can shut us back indoors every time there's a blip in the NHS, instead of actually investing in the NHS and you know building up ICU capacity, which is what they should have been doing this past year, are they really going to hold the British people to ransom again with all the dreadful damage you know, collateral horror that listeners have been telling us about. Now onto our listener emails, a selection of the fantastic messages you send each week to Liam and me at planetnormal at telegraph.co.uk. Please keep them coming. We love hearing from you and we learn so much. And, and, and here's an email, Liam, which is on the very theme that we were just discussing. Dear Liam and Alison, this is from Dr. Martin. Please do enjoy your well-earned rest in the South Atlantic on Ascension Island or any other of those island places on the green list. I and many others will miss the weekly fun of the podcast where empathy, common sense and humour are the main criteria for you and your guests. It is with weariness that I point out another of the absurd consequences of the test and trace fiasco. I work in a moderately large maternity unit which is able to care for critically ill mothers where neonatal intensive care is required for the baby as well. The next closer similar units are in Preston and Manchester. 
we and all other maternity units in the area are experiencing acute shortages of midwives. Kids are isolating from school, test and trace pings. Mums are having to stay home to look after kids, all on top of a chronic shortage of midwives in the first place. This is leading to intense pressure on delivery suites with consequent impact on providing timely, safe maternity care. It has now reached absurdity when the two biggest maternity units in the North West are seeking to either offload patients to neighbouring maternity units or borrow midwives from other units in order to try to remain open and safely care for women and babies. As your three impressive female guests from Us For Them pointed out last week, There is a lack of women being involved with decision making at the highest level, resulting in policies which ignore the specific impact on children and women of those policies. With very best wishes, Martin. Here's one from Ruth. There is something really bothering me. I work for a company that supplies medical devices to the NHS. We've now heard from a number of hospitals they've been told to ensure there's extra paediatric capacity this winter as they're expecting an influx of babies and children with severe respiratory infections, not COVID, but things such as flu. The severity of these infections will be due to the fact that children have been shielded from normal bugs for most of the last 18 months. So the natural immunity they would have built up had they not been locked down and kept away from their peers will not have developed. I've seen news stories saying this is now happening in New Zealand. What I really can't understand is why our government, which must know about this if people like me do, is still imposing restrictions sending children home en masse from schools when COVID is basically now endemic. The time to build up general immunity among children is surely now, not keep them restricted until flu season when they're more likely to get severely ill. The British media's not picked this up as far as I'm aware. I feel I have to somehow speak out because the way children have been treated during this whole appalling fiasco is criminal. Thank you so much, Alison and Liam, for everything you've done to call out and fight the tyrannical, nonsensical response to this virus. Thanks to you, Ruth, for a fabulous email. Yes, Liam, I've been hearing so much from medical contacts about children in hospital with respiratory infections, non-COVID. So there we have one of the absolutely key collateral damages of of lockdown. We have a lot of wonderful emails, don't we, Halligan? But this is an exceptional one, quite long. This is from Catherine. So it, it paints a picture of a whole world. Catherine says, I can vividly remember wandering around London with a friend the weekend before we were all grounded for the first time back in March last year as we both stood gazing at a deserted Tower Bridge wondering if the world was going mad. As I said to my friend at the time, oh, for pity's sake, it's not exactly Ebola. That kills 50% of those who get it. But I crushed my natural scepticism and gave the government the benefit of the doubt. I work in local government and overnight, I found myself redeployed to contact vulnerable and shielding residents to chat to them to make sure they had access to what they needed. Over the course of just the Easter weekend, I made over 100 phone calls to shielding residents. Some of the conversations I had will haunt me forever. From the gentleman who cheerfully told me that he'd ripped up his letter from Matt Hancock and was carrying on as normal, because after all, we've all got to die sometime and I don't see why I should die miserable. To the young single mother on her own with no support and four children who was desperately lonely and just wanted a friendly voice to talk to. I spent nearly an hour on the phone to a well-spoken gentleman in his 50s who had lost his business, was facing losing his home and was desperately worried about the mental health of his 10-year-old son. Do you have any idea what it's like to hear something in a man's voice and just ask the simple question, are you sure you're all right? And the answer is hearing a grown man crying uncontrollably down the phone to a complete stranger, utterly distraught because the life he worked so hard to build up had just vanished at the stroke of a pen, all the time knowing there's nothing you can do to take that pain away. I sucked it up and ran for miles through the local woods each day. It stopped me thinking about these people whose lives had been turned to rubble. I compiled with the rules and got on with life as far as I possibly could. Then in August last year, we received the news that we we could restart face-to-face brownie meetings 
I emailed the parents of the girls in my unit, asking if they'd be interested in a few meetings over the summer. Within seconds of hitting send, one mother emailed back, yes, please, just take them, they're desperate to do normal things. A week later, we met eight of the brownies in the park for some games and a scavenger hunt. Like I said, Alison and Liam, I tried to squash my scepticism and give the government the benefit of the doubt, but what I saw that afternoon made me so, so angry. These girls had, over the course of four months of sage and government-inspired brainwashing and virtually no schooling, been transformed from a happy, harem scarum, giggling, scatty, chatty, loud, boisterous group of children into girls who were fearful, anxious, who stood isolated from each other, warily looking around as if the bogeyman was about to leap out at them. There was no interaction, there was no smiling, there was nothing, there were tears from some, where once they used to run across the park screeching to each other. They now walk tentatively in a crocodile, refusing to make eye contact and my heart broke for them. I knew these girls and at that point I decided I was done with masks, done with hand sanitizer, done with social distancing, done with risk assessments, done with COVID. I climbed a tree. I dared the girls to follow me. Do you mean to say we can climb that tree? One said to me. I started a game of stuck in the mud. I picked the younger ones up under their arms and spun them around like tops until we were dizzy with laughter. One nine-year-old looked at me halfway through the evening and said, it felt like we'd been forgotten. I bit my lip, ignored my risk assessment and hugged her tightly. The following morning, mothers were emailing me, all saying the same thing. Thank you, she hasn't stopped talking about it. She came home buzzing. Then, last Monday, the email started coming in. I'm afraid she's not coming tonight. There's been one case of COVID in her year group and they've got to self-isolate for 10 days. She's fine, but they've sent the whole year group home. That evening, half of our brownie unit was missing. Speaking to the ones that were there, they told me that only years four and five were in school at the moment. Out of 140 pupils in their school, only 245 were in. This situation is utterly nuts. What the hell are we doing to children? Since that August Brownie meeting, I've refused to give the government the benefit of the doubt. I can tell you it's felt very lonely at times as I've refused to unquestioningly tow the government line. Thank you for Planet Normal. While I may still be angry with the mendacious hypocrites and their manipulation of the data to enable the continuation of restrictions, the G7 barbecue, the quiet publication of the statutory instrument at 4am giving UEFA officials carte blanche to enter the country unimpeded, Matt chuffing Hancock, knowing that each Thursday morning I can lie in bed after my alarm goes off, listening to you both, and knowing that there are some who feel the same way as me has made life a little less lonely and made me even more determined to give those brownies the most amazing time, even if it's only once a week for an hour and a half. Next week, we're making rocket fuel with hydrogen peroxide and yeast. Thank you and kind regards, Catherine. Wow. This is from Gail. Dear Alison and Liam, Thank you for your wonderful podcast, which I've listened to throughout the pandemic. It's brought a breath of sanity to the hysteria we've been living through. I'm writing to let you know about a deterioration in my local GP service in Reading. They've introduced that new e-consult system, so you can no longer arrange an appointment with your GP in a straightforward way. You have to complete a long set of largely irrelevant questions online, and often you're then directed to 111, and you don't get an appointment to speak to anybody. Even if they get back to you to give you an appointment, they no longer give you an appointment time. You're told they will call you on a certain date. Clearly, this is hopeless for anyone, especially those who work. Are we supposed to take a whole day off and wait by the phone? It feels as if some GPs are doing everything they can to deter us, to push patients away. This will lead to further undiagnosed and untreated conditions, adding to the post-pandemic healthcare crisis. Thank you, Gail. We've had so many emails like that about service that some GPs, some GPs are providing. 
And finally, from Peter, Alison, Liam, I'm concerned about the effect your Planet Normal holiday may have on the mental health of the nation. But as you've been doing more than most to keep us sane for the past year, just go away and have a good time. We'll binge on chips till you return. The interview with us for them last week was great. Such inspiring people. And I wouldn't disagree with anything they said, but wasn't the elephant in the room, the teaching unions. My point is, it's not just the government who decide whether schools are open or on what terms with masks, etc. Yet there was no mention of this, even though it was pretty blatant in January 2021 that Her Majesty's government were bounced by the unions. My view is the manner in which we are treating children in schools is abusive, pure and simple. We must call out all those responsible. It's too easy just to blame the government. Keep up the good work and happy holidays. Well, Peter, thanks very much. We think everyone deserves a holiday, Halligan. Indeed. And talking of holidays, that's it from Planet Normal for another week because we leave our sanctuary of sweet reason, our flying refuge of reason views. Email of the week, it's your call, Alison. I think it's got to go to, we've had wonderful ones, I think it's got to go to Catherine Brown Owl for that marvellous evocation of her attempts to keep children happy. So, Catherine Brownell, send us by email your postal address and you'll get one of those rare as rocking horse poo, rare as hen's teeth, Planet Normal mugs. You can't buy them in the shops or even online. Certainly worth having. And just before we go, just to confirm, we've talked about it in the emails and in recent weeks, Planet Normal will be taking a two-week break from next week, so we won't be with you on the 22nd of July or the 29th of July. But we will be back full of vim and vigour to enjoy our, our new freedoms. Um, hopefully everything will be open by then. If you enjoy Planet Normal, do leave us a rating and review on Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to your podcasts. It really helps others to find us so the Planet Normal family can grow. And as we speed away from our beloved Planet Normal and the madness of Planet Earth comes back into view, thanks as ever. To our producers, Louisa Wells, Isabel Bouchard and Elliot Lampitt and our editor, Theodora Leloudis. Stay safe and stay in touch with us and with each other. And until, well, a few weeks' time, it's goodbye from me. Happy holidays, Halligan, and it's goodbye from him.